Hello everyone, my name is Bo Medina. I'm the Conference and Event Manager at the AIOH. Um, and we have Bruce Cannon here, who is our presenter today from World Australia. Bruce will be presenting the webinar, Welding Fume Hazards and Risks, an update. Um, before I hand the floor over to Bruce, I'm just going to give a quick AIOH update. Uh, just a, a, an, up, an October update. Uh, if you don't know who our council members are already, Ross D. Coletto is our president. Kate Cole is our president-elect. Alex Todorovic is our treasurer. Sharon Johnson, our secretary. And Marcus Brooks, Melody Windust and Kelly Johnson, who are our councillors. Uh, the office team is myself. Katie Page, oh, oops, sorry, <laughs> Alicia Gorman, this is an older one, I, uh, I missed that. Um, Alicia Gorman is our new membership coordinator and Craig Price is our bookkeeper. Uh, and just for those who don't know, our exhibition and conference has been postponed till March. So if you haven't bought your tickets, they are available at the moment. We do have a uh, 100% uh, refund policy due to COVID. So if you're concerned about crossing borders, just be aware that um, we do have a special refund policy around this. Um, so feel free to start buying tickets um, if you can see yourself um, coming to the conference in March. Our next, uh, our next webinar is with the AIHS. Uh, we're doing a, a collaborative webinar. This is the Ventilation and Filtration Critical Workplace Safety Controls in a COVID Era webinar. You need to go through the website in order to register through this, um, and it is through the AIHS. Um, so if you have any issues registering, which I know a few people have, um, just make sure you reach out to them directly. However, uh, there is a, 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 a particular a tick button, a button at the bottom of that webinar that uh, is for AI, uh, AIOH members. So um, just be mindful um, just to tick that button. And you will, if you're a member, um, it is free for members. Uh, we have one, uh, one course left uh, for the basic principles occupation hygiene course. That's in Sydney. Um, and that's on the 22nd to the 26th of November. So we have um, we have that course available and still some places available if you are looking to get somebody into uh, into the basic principles course. Um, so be quick because we're I think we're probably about six more spots before that's at capacity. Um, so that's just the, an update from the AIOH. Um, I'm going to pass this over to you now, Bruce. You're on mute, Bruce. Just just. Checking all of the, uh, getting the buttons ready Excellent. to go you. for you. I'm going to jump out, but um, I Thank am here you. in the background. Should you need me, just sing out and I'll be available. Thank no us. worries. No, it's good to see some familiar names popping up in the chat screen here. So, um, okay, now find the right screen to share and we'll be in business. Okay. Now, it's not sharing for some reason. I've got a technical issue here at the moment, um, Bo, for some reason, uh, this does not want to share. Okay, so the, you're pressing the start, the start uh, sharing screen? Yes, I'm just going to go back and we'll just try this again. I do have the presentation another way if we need hang to hang on hang on no it, it's for some reason it's it's not showing up to it to actually chrome tab no window tire screen no it's not it's not it's not uh, letting me share the screen at the moment um, Bo. for some reason okay no, no not to worry just give me a second i'll share my screen um Apologies, everyone. We won't be long. It's always the way.
Okay, I have my screen. Okay, yes, if you just screen that, what I'll, what I'll have to do is just tell you when to flick on to the next page. That's all right. So, the, so that's unfortunately, we'll just do what we can do. So I'll put this one down to um, Chrome not behaving nicely for some reason. Okay, th thanks for that, Bo. Um, well, welcome everybody. And firstly, on behalf of Weld Australia and in particular our Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Jeff Crittenden, and our National Corporate Business Manager, Mr. Alistair Forbes, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sharon Johnson and the AOIH for the invitation to um, uh, speak to you all today on welding fume hazards and risks. So if we move to the next slide, please. Okay. To do, introduce uh, this talk today, I would like to start at the beginning of any uh, workplace health and safety process. And that primarily means that we must commence with conducting a risk assessment on the activities in question. In this instance, whilst the risk assessment will usually be in the hands of those responsible for the welding activities, my role today will be to provide you with basic information on the hazards associated with arc welding in general, and then the main mitigation strategies. Without this knowledge, it is difficult to know uh, what you do not know, which can easily lead to injuries. Uh, this will lead into a discussion on fume and the IARC's ruling on weld fume and cancer, including provision of information relevant to IARC's deliberations, which you may or may not be familiar with, and where the ruling investigation is currently at. We will finish the, the morning with a brief discussion on international trends of relevance to welding and the uh, AIOH. Next slide, please. Next slide there, Bo. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with arc welding, there are four fundamental hazards that welders and their assistants will be exposed to. These are non-ionizing radiation in the form of infrared, ultraviolet and intense visible light. Electric shock and electrocution, burns and weld fume. There's, of course, there's also noise and other things as well, but these are the four uh, principal uh, issues of concern. Each of these hazards will be discussed in detail in the following slides. So if we could move to the next slide, please. There are six elements in the hierarchy of controls, although some of you may think of five. In order of preference and applications, these are elimination, substitution, isolation, engineering, administration, and personal protective equipment or PPE. Some authorities may agree isolation with engineering controls. However, some industries intentionally separate it out because uh, of its specialized functions that be, can, can be quite separate from engineered solutions. Engineered solutions can reduce the level of a hazard that a person is exposed to, but in isolation, the person is completely isolated from the hazard. For arc welding, opportunities to utilize these control options can be limited. And in many situations, personal protective equipment, for example, may in fact be the only option available to protect the welder and personnel nearby. Next slide, please, Bo. In terms of radiation, arc welding emits non-ionizing radiation as infrared, ultraviolet and visible light. The intense visible light causes extreme glare and temporary blindness until the eye can adjust. Infrared radiation is generally not considered harmful as the intense heat usually causes considerable discomfort before it causes skin burning. The clothing, gloves and face shield with uh, welding filters will protect the wearer, but long-term exposure to excessive infrared can cause eye cataracts. For ultraviolet light, it can cause burning similar to sunburn, and all exposed skin must be covered, including from reflected ultraviolet radiation. <clears throat> 
A user receiving a direct arc flash can develop a small or a painful condition known as arc eye a few hours later, which is akin to sunburn within the eye. Symptoms will subside over a day or two, but it is incredibly painful. The only, uh, only uh, relief from such pain uh, is something like uh, anaesthetic eye drops, but which you've obviously got to be very careful of if you can actually get your hands on them. The wearing of safety glasses, though, will uh, provide a level of protection against arc eye, as the glasses generally reflect or absorb a lot of the UV. Long-term risks of UV exposure can include skin cancers and ocular eye cancers. IARC reclassified ultraviolet radiation from arc welding as group to group uh, 1A carcinogenic to humans in 2017 via its nomograph 118. When this was released, it did not come as a surprise. Certainly to myself. Next slide, please. Radiation from arc welding has a wavelength ranging from 200 nanometers in the UVC component of the ultraviolet spectrum uh, through the visible light spectrum and into the infrared spectrum or region at a wavelength of 1400 nanometers. Ultraviolet radiation sits at the short wavelength end of the spectrum and is grouped into three bands, these being UVA, B and C. UVB, which is usually regarded as about 289 to 315 nanometer wavelength, is known to penetrate into the epidermis or outer layers of the skin and is the prime component of the UV spectrum associated with skin cancer, cataracts and sunburn. Whilst the sun produces UVA, UVB and UVC, the ozone layer absorbs much of the shorter wavelength UVB and all UVC. Arc welding produces um, UV in all three components, A, B and C. And uh, for those unfamiliar with UVC, it is used in sterilization and is known to damage the uh, DNA of bacteria and viruses. Unfortunately, we do not know much else about the effects of UVC and additional research is required. Next slide, please, Bo. Just to put the UV spectrum into some perspective, as I indicated in the previous slide, UVC and most of the UVB spectrum produced by the sun is absorbed by the ozone layer with some UVB and all of UVA reaching the Earth's surface. Whilst I specifically mentioned the skin damage from UVB in the previous slide, it is the UVA wavelengths that are generally responsible for the aging and wrinkling of the recipient's skin. Note that commercial jet aircraft typically fly in the lower stratosphere or stratosphere at altitudes of nine uh, to 12 kilometers or up to 40,000 feet. This pictograph is talking about it in the 15 kilometer region, which is in practice is a bit high. Next slide, please. Importantly, what actions are required to minimize risks uh, regarding the welder's exposure to ultraviolet radiation? Well, Weld Australia recommends that all direct exposure to ultraviolet radiation from arc welding processes be avoided. Control options include wearing approved uh, protective clothing specifically designed for welding. It involves covering all exposed areas of the skin with clothing that incorporates a high UPF rating and the use of suitable darkened eye filters or auto darkening face shields, which are readily available now. And also the regular application of sunscreen with a high SPF factor in conformance with the manufacturer's instructions. Welders and people working in the vicinity of arc welding processes should also wear safety glasses at all times to minimize the risk of receiving an accidental arc flash and subsequent arc eye in the hours after the receiving the flash. I can say from uh, bitter experience, it does not take long uh, to uh, burn somebody if they're not fully protected. Uh, I was working with an occupational hygienist once and uh, 
uh, we and and they thought they were well protected. Unfortunately, though, what happened was there was a reflection of the ultraviolet light um, uh, off the clothes and uh, up underneath the um, face shield, um, around the neck and into the uh, the edge of the ears. And when they reported the next day that they had a lovely red complexion all around the neck and down into this region here, which you can see where my finger is here, um, and it was just felt like sunburn. So um, you could could say it's um, you could be a redneck for a few days, but uh, of course without the uh, political connotations that that sort of statement can carry with it. Okay, next slide, please. Welding power sources can have a very high open circuit voltage because we're going to talk now briefly about electrical hazards. And it is typically in this high risk situations where voltages need to be limited. Now the Australian standard 1674 part two sets these limits according to the environmental risk as shown on your slide. Some training institutions claim that they meet category A because of their perception that the welder is insulated from the welding circuit. In practice, these claims are questionable. And whilst many fabricators think their welders are working in a category B environment, such as in a normal workshop, given the hot nature of welding work and the fact that people sweat when hot, the welder and operator may be in a category C environment without realizing. Sweat and dampness rapidly compromises the insulation resistance of uh, protective gloves and clothing. And it is important to note that most electric shocks are received by welders when changing electrode or when preparing to initiate the arc, or even by their assistants whilst uh, holding a workpiece. Next slide, please. In addition, um, the gas tungsten arc or TIG process can use uh, what's called a HF type uh, starting arc. Now those HF type starting arcs have a voltage of anywhere between three to 5,000 volts or even more, but at a very low current. Now HF tends to flow over the surface of skin somewhat um, akin to a Tesla coil, but it is insidious as it can be destructive to poorly shielded electronic equipment and equipment can be damaged away from the location of welding, particularly where the uh, earthing and the shielding is inadequate. But from a welding perspective, people with metallic implants, in particular cochlear implants, pacemakers and the like, should uh, not be located anywhere near where HF is being used or work in pro uh, proximity. And that could be where aluminium is welded, for example. That's a, a typical uh, situation where you might run into that particular process. Next slide, please. Approved welders uh, clothing and gloves can provide you with good protection from electric shock if it's dry, hole free and in good condition. If the clothing or personal protective equipment does get damp from sweat or moisture, its resistivity drops rapidly, exposing the welder to an electric shock should they come into contact with the welding circuit. And this is not uncommon. Um, resistances as low as 500 ohms are known to permit sufficient current to flow that can cause a fatality. And I'm certainly aware of a fatality up in uh, Townsville uh, back about 2011 where this was certainly the case. And there was a, a fatality in the Illawarra, I think it was about 2004 where this was uh, certainly the situation. Now, for just so that you're uh, the non-electrically uh, savvy you're aware, at 20 volts AC, a 500 ohm will cause 40 milliamp to flow. And uh, depending on the current path, this can cause a fatality because it, it's sufficient to cause heart fibrillation. At 65 uh, volt DC, which is quite common in some older machines uh, on an open circuit voltage or even higher, at 500 ohms, that will cause 130 milliamp to flow. And to an susceptible uh, individual, particularly someone who has heart conditions, that could be fatal. Now, I'm going to state quite clearly that occupational hygienists should not normally be exposed to welding-related electrical hazards 
maybe other than the HF. But they do need to be aware of them, particularly if they have an electronic medical device on them or implanted within, such as pacemakers or cochlear implants. And if you do, if you do have a pacemaker and welding's in progress nearby, move away as, as soon as possible if you can or call out for assistance. Do not hesitate. Once welding stops, if the welding is the cause of the disruption to your pacemaker, um, your symptoms will subside. Next slide, please. Now, because of the number of electric shock incidents and the challenges investigators were having here in Australia and elsewhere uh, overseas, uh, Weld Australia, together with some international experts, particularly from Canada, produced the electric shock and injury reporting form, which forms part of our uh, electrical uh, safety technical note 22, both of which you can see on your screen. This technical note on the left is available for purchase from the World Australia shop. However, the electric shock injury and electrocution reporting form on the right can be downloaded free of charge via the shop um, as one of our technical guidance notes. This technical guidance notes was recently revised and reissued based on user feedback. So if you are aware of any people that have suffered an electric shock and it needs to be investigated, which it, it should be and promptly, um, so point them in the direction of this particular document. It might help prevent a reoccurrence. And if there's any difficulty with understanding it, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. Next slide, please, Bo. Now, aside from burns arising from ultraviolet and infrared radiation, the welders and their assistants can be burnt through direct contact with hot or molten metal, including spatter and slag. And the uh, spatter and slag can certainly travel considerable distances. Hot spatter and slag can easily penetrate clothing. Hence, it is important that the clothing worn, which includes your underwear, is non-flammable. Synthetics should never be worn as they can melt to the skin and actually cause serious localised burning. Occupational hygienists can be exposed to this hazard. So when working with or near welders, make sure that you wear suitable flame resistant uh, cotton drill or wooden woolen clothing. And remember that hot metal looks exactly like cold metal. So do not touch. Next slide, please. Now, moving into the a fume, which is the prime uh, subject of our discussion this, uh, this afternoon. Looking specifically at welding fume, all arc processes produce weld fume, some more so than others. The level of fume produced will vary with the conditions of welding. But all weld fume must be regarded as hazardous and therefore controlled. The main general components of weld fume are shown on the slide. However, I do not intend to go into the specifics of each uh, components of each of these, such as your uh, it might be iron, manganese, chrome, etc., etc., etc. But uh, but be aware that some of the components can be carcinogenic, such as chrome six or nickel, or even poisonous in their own right such as phosgene, which is produced when ultraviolet light from uh, arc welding or other sources interacts with certain chlorinated hydrocarbon solvents. Importantly, it must be realized that with some process, the fume will not be visible to the welder nor the observer. For example, TIG welding, uh, you may not necessarily see any fume. It is the respirable non-visible component that is potentially the most hazardous because of its very fine particulate size. Be aware too that these ultra fine particulates, just like dust particles, can remain suspended in air for up to two days. I did see some other um, data recently that suggested 24 hours, but I have definitely seen and heard uh, statements of significantly long periods, longer periods. If somebody comes along with a broom or a vacuum cleaner or whatever, they stir it up again and around it goes. Uh, next slide, please, Bo. Just to put fume particles uh, into perspective, welding fume particles are extremely small 
uh, as shown on the slide. So it can penetrate deep into the lungs where gas exchange takes place and in most cases are not removed. In other words, they are respirable. They can also be in the nanoparticle range and smaller than 100 nanometers. As I noted in the previous slide, these particles can remain airborne for up to 48 hours. Hygienists should be aware that visible plume is an indication that exposures may not be well controlled, particularly if the plume remains suspended in the building where welding is taking place. However, an absence of a visible plume does not indicate a safe level of exposure depending on the materials and consumables involved. Just for the information of people here, in a previous job uh, prior to joining Weld Australia, I used to do a lot of flux cord welding using a travel carriage. If we didn't turn on the fume extraction system within five minutes, we would fill quite a large building with fume. Doesn't take very long. Next slide, please. As many of you would be aware, weld fume was declared as carcinogenic to humans in 2017 by the International Agency responsible for assessing such risks, IARC. They reclassified welding fume from group 2B, possibly carcinogenic to humans, to group 1A, carcinogenic to humans in March uh, 2017. For those of you who do not know who IARC is, and up until 2017, that included myself, IARC is the International Agency for Research on Cancer and is a voluntary organisation consisting of experts from around the world. It is part of the United Nations World Health Organisation, or WHO. You will note on the slide that I've underlined the first letters of the organisation's name to show where the acronym IARC comes from. Next slide, please. Now, just pausing for a moment before I move on with discussing weld fume, I would like to introduce you all to the International Institute of Welding. This particular organisation of which Weld Australia is a member is a collective, uh, has a collective of 18 working units, each of which uh, has its unit of specialty. Commission 8, for example, uh, specialises in health, safety and the environment and actually had an observer at IARC's deliberations on weld fume and its links to cancer. And based on IARC's deliberations, the IOW's Commission 8 recently produced a statement of advice for the welding industry on weld fume and cancer, which I'm about to present to you. Next slide, please. Now, in announcing the statement, uh, the uh, IOW released a press release in July. And you can see the uh, on the screen, you can see it's uh, the document number for that particular press release. What they said was in 2018, IARC published monograph 118. It took a little bit of time to get it to actually print the document in which welding fumes were evaluated and he reclassified them as group one, which is carcinogenic to humans. And based on this assessment, IARC revised its evaluation from that issued in 1990 when it classified welding fumes as possibly carcinogenic to humans or group 2B. This assessment was based on an epidemiological risk uh, or excess risk for lung cancer and was supported by publications on local and systemic inflammatory processes and a suppressive effect on the immune system caused by welding fumes. Hopefully um, you, you people have had a lot more medical exposure than I have and you fully understand what the, is being said there. The IOW statement on lung cancer in welding back in 2003, Commission 8 issued a statement on the excess risk of lung cancer in electric arc welders. And in 2011, this statement was reconfirmed. The International Institute of Welding at that stage recommended that to eliminate the excess risk of lung cancer, welders and their mass managers must ensure that exposure to welding fumes is minimized at least to national guidelines, and that there is no further exposure of welders to asbestos 
and welders are encouraged and assisted not to smoke tobacco. I would add other substances to that list, but that's a personal opinion. On the balance of the evidence, the grade of risk uh, excess has been confirmed. This assessment has been corroborated also in meta-analysis published subsequently after IARC monograph 118, which in 2019. Again, the excess risk has been shown irrespective of the type of steel, which be it mild steel or stainless steel welded. Next slide, please. In addition to lung cancer, IARC stated that there is also an ex uh, excess risk for kidney cell cancer as shown in several ep epidemiological studies. The evidence was rated limited due to the fact that any confounding effect of solvents could not be ruled out. The IIW recommends that to eliminate the excess risk of lung cancer, welders and their managers must ensure that exposure to welling fume is minimized to at least national guidelines. IARC also classified ultraviolet radiation from arc welding as carcinogenic with sufficient evidence for group one. And based on its excess risk of uveal and melanoma of welders found in some epidemiological studies. Therefore, based on the current state of knowledge, the International Institute of Welding confirms its statement from 2011 and encourages all those responsible to reduce the exposure to welding fume to a minimum. Next slide, please. Now, as I indicated, uh, the International uh, Institute of Welding had an expert observer at the IARC uh, deliberations. Now, Dr. Wolfgang Zeischer, now hopefully I've pronounced his name correctly because uh, I have uh, minimal knowledge of German. Uh, Dr. Dr. Zeischer was a past chair of Commission 8, Health and Safety and Environment, and he is a medical doctor specialising in industrial medicine. He has worked with the German insurance industry, which is akin to like the um, safe work uh, people here in Australia. He provided the background material shown on the slide to Commission 8. Of particular note on this slide, the results in the studies were quite variable and showed a range of results ranging from no additional risk to welders developing lung cancer to quite significant risk. It is also important to note that the level of fume management in the studies is unknown and was probably minimal, if any. In other words, there was probably no level of um, the fume extraction. Next slide, please. At this stage, it is believed that the link between lung cancer and weld fume is most likely linked to a particulate sizing issue. However, this is yet to be established and further research is required to validate this hypothesis. Two points I would like to draw your attention to on the slide you can see before you um, are that firstly, there is a small but significant risk of welders developing lung cancer, irrespective of their smoking status. And in some studies, the risks may be partially masked in smokers, because of the much higher risk that smokers face. Secondly, IARC's data analysis process is ongoing and uh, Commission 8 is being kept updated at their uh, six monthly meetings. Next slide, please. Now let us look at some relatively fume generation rates from the different welding processes. And I hope you can see that clearly on your screens. It is very important to note that the, the weld and related fume is not always visible. And it is the non-visible component that is potentially the most hazardous because of its particle size. Most of the relative rates shown in the graphic uh, from the Australian Cancer Council should not come as a surprise. But be aware though that in Australia, we do not generally use the term mag that you can see on the screen. Uh, and in practice, we use what fabricators uh, colloquially describe uh, the process MIG, even though it's not an inert gas is not being used. And in metal, in MAG, it's you use an active gas such as one of the argon-based mixes or carbon dioxide or CO2. So 
MAG is quite common in Australia, even though we don't call it that. Now, flux cord welding will have quite a range of uh, fume generation rates, as this group covers uh, flux cord consumables, which use a gas shield. Some of them might have trade names such as outer shield or dual shield, and there are others. And those that are self-shielded, which generate a lot of visible fume. In general, for other than submerged arc welding, where the arc is buried under a bed of flux, the higher the amperage, the greater the volume of flux generated. In addition, the flux is applied to manual consumables or used within flux cord consumables generate a lot of fluoride and other particulates, including metal oxides, and exacerbate this problem. And it should be noted that consumable other power source manufacturers are doing a lot of research to minimize fume generation rates through waveform controls applied to the gas metal arc or MIGMAG processes and the flux cord process groups. Of particular note, fume generation rates for thermal cutting, which is your oxy cutting, for example, and plasma cutting can be really high. And unless the process operator can keep their head out of the plume, the fume generator is potentially problematic. And this is actually recognized within monograph 118, where the researchers appear to have incorrectly classified flame cutting or uh, oxy cutting as gas welding when it's not really a welding process. Next slide, please. The most recent information from IARC is now shown on your screens and was reported by Dr. Seisha at the IOW Commission 8 meeting in July uh, of this year. The analysis to date show that the risk of lung cancer increases with the duration of welding in years. However, quite a few studies do not show positive correlations of the lung cancer risk, uh, estimated cumulative exposure or with the time of welding experience, which is exposure or the time since first exposure. But as they say, the story goes on. Next slide, please. To put the IARC statement into perspective, now that I've scared the heck out of a lot of people, I've been able to load some, or locate some statistics on lung cancer rates in the USA. And current data for Australia is believed to be similar, but the pictorial in this slide represents the information in a very simple and practical manner. The challenge for reviewing statistics on lung cancer is being able to drill down through the various risk factors. And unfortunately, many studies publish uh, lump data uh, for cancer rates for smokers and non-smokers together. Many statistics are also published as cancer rates per 100,000 people rather than the percentages shown in this slide. So let's start with the findings of IARC. The studies reviewed by IARC reported this, that statistically non-smoking welders have a 20 to 40% higher risk of developing lung cancer. In practice, the rates of risk varied from 0% through to over 40% in the studies, but generally range from this 20 to 40% range. You will come across people, um, certainly those selling fume control equipment, for example, that will highlight this 40% component, but uh, we need to keep uh, things in perspective so that the debate doesn't become uh, is technical, not uh, emotional. The increased risk to welders who smoke was not evident in the statistics. However, it is understood that this risk also applies to this cohort, but was not evident in the studies, primarily because people who smoke have a much greater underlying risk because of their smoking. Now, because most welders are likely to be males, I've used the male statistics in this particular incident. And noting the statistics, the following is evident. For non-smokers, 200 in 100,000 males, as in males of the general population, are likely to develop lung cancer in their lifetime, whether they weld or not. For welders in this group, this risk will rise to 240 to 280 per 100,000, or 0.24 to 0.28%. In other words, a small but significant increase in risk. 
For males who smoke at least five cigarettes a day, which is what they class as a heavy smoker, and I'm sure those who smoke would debate this point, 24,400 in 100,000 males statistically are likely to develop lung cancer in their lifetime. And for male welders who smoke, this risk will be 24,440 to 24,480 in 100,000 people. Statistically, at this base magnitude, the slight increase in this cohort is, unlikely, is likely to be masked, as you're talking about approximately a one in four male smoker likely to develop lung cancer, whether they weld or not. Not very good statistics. Next slide, please. Looking at national uh, positions, uh, in response to the uh, mon monograph 118. And what you can see here on the screen were the positions with, with that were correct in 2020. The United Kingdom's HSE has issued some guidance to the industry, which has been tempered uh, somewhat since from their original ruling that effectively required all welders to wear powered air purifying respirator devices. Their current ruling is somewhat similar to the recommendations in Welding, Weld Australia's fume minimisation guidelines, which I'll talk about in a minute. It must be said, though, that evidence indicates uh, that the HSE typically only enforced their ruling when they came on site for reasons other than welding. In other words, an accident or an incident. Next slide, please. The USA position is a little different because of the litigious nature of uh, the country. The American Welding Society and its reviewers were of the opinion that the review of their national exposure standards was not required. However, this may not necessarily appear to reflect the current position of OSHA as far as I'm aware. I'll give you a moment to just look at that slide. Now, for the, for the information of everybody uh, present, the ANSI document Z49.1 is uh, downloadable free of charge from the American Welding Society. And it's somewhat similar, uh, but not necessarily as comprehensive as the uh, technical note seven that Weld Australia has, which I'll show you in a moment. Next slide, please. The fume minimisation guidelines that have been published by Weld Australia were originally produced by the Cooperative Research Centre for Materials Welding and Joining in 1999 in conjunction with the University of Wollongong and with the then Welding Technology Institute of Australia, which is now Weld Australia, and industry support. The work involved measuring weld fume emissions, this is real weld um, weld fume emissions are measured in still air for common processes. So they actually had a, a mannequin with a, um, a filtrate or device, sampling device uh, on mounted in the usual position around the face inside of a shield. And then they had the welding process on the end of a robot um, underneath so that the fume could be captured and measured. The guidelines were revised in 2019 and its recommendations uh, produced in 1999 remain equally valid today. Next slide, please. Now the current edition of the fume minimization guidelines is shown on your screen and that's available from the World Australia shop. So if you miss getting the link shown on the screen, if you go to the uh, World Australia website, which is worldaustralia.com.au, and then click on the resources tab, you'll uh, come to the shop. And you, uh, you can then scroll through the options or the on the left of the screen, you will find uh, the option to um, create some filters, which can help you get closer to the documents you're seeking. Uh, next slide, please. Now, all arc welding processes produce weld fume and control requirements will vary with the work site. 
In this extract from the fume minimization guidelines for the gas metal arc or MIG or MAC process, Fans or fume extraction may be required depending on the placement of the work, the direction of any airflow and placement of the welder's head. However, if the welder's head is in the plume, which it typically will be in many situations because fabricators like welders to be working downhand or in the flat position where productivity is maximised, personal protective equipment is also recommended to minimise exposure to the welder. This will be a P2 mask most likely, or the powered air purifying respirator. Now the welders prefer these respirators primarily because it is comfortable to wear, especially on hot days. And it supplies a steady stream of purified air to the welders breathing zone. In addition, P2 masks must be fit tested to clean shaven welders and few welders are, to ensure that they are effectively effective. And unfortunately, they are known to be uncomfortable to wear, particularly for extended periods. For welding work um, in welding booths, some form of fume extraction is usually the appropriate control, as these booths can be regarded as an enclosed or limited workspace. Again, if the welder's head is in the plume, PPE is also required to minimise exposure. It should be noted that whilst uh, good local ventilation may be adequate to ensure compliance with the statutory exposure limits, to minimise the risks associated with fume exposure, supplementary controls of the PAPRs are usually required. And if you look at the three graphics on the bottom of your screen, you can see that the spread of results obtained on the left uh, from gas metal arc welding um, results. Depending on what was happening at the time, your, um, your MIG fume may or may not be within the uh, five milligram cubic meter exposure limit, but in all situations, ozone was always over the, over the limit, so a level of control was required. In the middle um, graphic, you can see that depending on airflow, which can come from a fan or a breeze or whatever, uh, you can see the directions that you prefer for people to, uh, for the breeze to flow, which is across the welder, not coming in front or behind because it uh, masks the flow of air. And for head position, you've got the picture on the right. Now for each of the welding processes, the few minimization guidelines has these diagrams uh, throughout uh, for each of the processes that were actually measured. So a document well worth getting um, to assist the industry should you wish to be able to give people something. Next slide, please. Just a couple of quick examples of fume control. I haven't shown you any fume extractors, but on the left, you can see an example of an on-torch fume extraction system. Um, and on the right is an example of a powered air purifying respirator. The on-torch systems uh, shown on the left are not generally favoured by welders as they can be heavy and bulky and awkward to use. Although there are some uh, recent developments where they are much lighter than they used to be and uh, gradually achieving greater acceptance. They, they can uh, remove typically around 70% of fume. Some of them claim up to 90% fume extraction, um, but even so, uh, you still need uh, some extra uh, protection if the welder's head gets in the, into the plume. Now, power air uh, purifying respirators, which is the one on the right is, uh, is typical of, are reasonably, uh, work very well, particularly in well-ventilated areas, but they are not suitable in areas where fume can build up very quickly as the, the filters being small will, be, will clog. Used in the right environment, one of these units will work quite happily for an eight hour shift before you have to change filters. So you, sh you certainly shouldn't be using them in a confined space, for example. Uh, next slide, please, Bo. At this point, I would like to bring your attention to the publications on uh, the slide that you can see before you. All in this particular case, all three are available free of charge from the Weld Australia website. 
Now on the left, our technical note seven is a definitive reference on the hazards and controls associated with welding and allied processes. It provides information on all aspects of health and safety in welding and cutting. And it's designed to provide this information in such a way that is readily usable for instruction in the shop and to provide guidance to management. Recommendations are given for the safe procedures to be adopted in a wide variety of situations found in welding fabrication. It is referenced within the codes of practice established when published by the various regulatory authorities. And in some cases, uh, the TechNote 7 is actually called up in their regulations as an, as a, an acceptable code of practice. A number of people uh, present here today and uh, mem other members of the AIOH uh, assisted uh, us in the most recent revision of this document. And I would just like to take this moment to gratefully acknowledge their assistance. Over the years, we've had many members of the AIOH assist in the um, development of previous editions of this particular technical note. Now in the middle section there, you will see the few minimization guidelines that uh, I was talking about, the cover of the document. As I said, that's readily available to download free of charge. Um, if you're not a member of World Australia, you will have to create a, um, a, an account uh, which is free and then you could then access this particular document and download it to your heart's content. And on the right, uh, this particular technical guidance note contains some of the free guides and forms that are shown in technical note seven as a collective and uh, that also can be readily downloaded. Now looking at international trends, as reported in the International Institutes Commission 8. The, the America, as in USA, reported that recently that OSHA had each issued a proposal to require manufacturers to provide a fume assessment for every combination of materials, consumables, and welding process or equipment. I would assume they're talking about a risk assessment here. Needless to say, the um, American Welding Society sees this as impractical and a public hearing is now being scheduled. In Europe, there are calls now calls for comments on a proposal for limits on emissions from welding. And the Europeans are looking for one specific limit irrespective of the process, which includes plasma cutting. In the United Kingdom, they are now uh, having Brexited they are now questioning some of the European safety directives currently applicable and are looking to establish their own evidence-based systems. Needless to say, the United Kingdom is actually winding back on some of these European directives. Next slide, please, Bo. Now, following IARC's ruling and the release of monograph 118, a number of countries have reviewed their exposure standards for welding fume. Whilst the countries concerned have not been identified um, in this slide, and uh, they certainly haven't been identified to me at this point in time, some of these trends that you can see are known to members of the AIOH and World Australia has noted that the AIOH has made some, um, similar representations to Safe Work Australia in their current review of hazardous chemical exposure levels relevant to welding. Um, if you can go to the next, I think we've probably a couple of slides back. Uh, one more if you uh, could, please. There we go. Thanks, um, Bo. My mistake there. Apologies. Um, <coughs> now, just looking at the, the uh, screen at the moment, um, there's four papers shown on the screen relevant to hexavalent chromium that have recently uh, formed part or published jointly by uh, Commissions 2 and Commissions 8 people from uh, on welding consumables. Um, some they may be of interest to you, I don't know. I um, Not shown on the screen, uh, but of interest to um, published paper from the Welding Institute 
uh, was a paper which was described as characteristics or characterization of arc welding fume samples by FTIR spectroscopy, which I assume is a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Um, the author actually made a comment that a silicon line was seen in this FITR output. And interestingly, this sent the consumable manufacturers present at the Commission 8 meeting into a frenzy, challenging this observation, because what it actually meant is that the uh, researcher had found silica in the welding fume. I would suggest at this stage, with, with how I haven't had any additional feedback from Commission 8 on this particular uh, point at the moment, but I would suggest to you all that we watch this space. And unfortunately, I do not have access to this paper as much as I would like to. It, it, it hasn't been released into the IOW systems at this stage. Now, the papers you can see on the screen are typically available to um, IIW members, which includes World Australia and its members. Um, but I'm not sure that I'd be able to uh, release these papers. I'd need permission to release these papers to non uh, members. Okay, next slide, please, Bo. ISO is also active in the weld fume space. And uh, committee TC44, subcommittee nine, recently had two active projects related to weld fume sampling and monitoring, which you can see on your screens. The subcommittee also has an active uh, project on welding curtains. Now, Australia is an active participant in this particular uh, subcommittee, and I'm definitely aware of an Australian working on the uh, committee uh, side for curtains and strips. I don't know if there's any Australians working in the sampling program that ISO has. Uh, if, you, if you need information on how to get access to uh, getting involved in ISO at any stage, um, Con if you could contact me through the AIOH and I can and point you in the right direction through Standards Australia there. Next slide, please, uh, Bo. Uh, for current standards, the ISO subcommittees are required to review their published standards every five years. And once reviewed, the standards are either endorsed, sent for revision or withdrawn. The three standards shown on your screens are currently scheduled for review in January next year. Uh, next slide, please, Bo. Just to summarize now, um, the four main hazards of welding are non-ionizing radiation, electric shock and electrocution, burns and fume exposure. For most of these items, personal protective equipment is the primary means of protection, particularly for exposure to ultraviolet and infrared radiation. For electric has, uh, hazards, uh, hazard reduction devices are readily available to minimize exposure to, to dangerous voltages. And uh, dry personal protective equipment, including clothing, is an integral component in the avoidance of electric shock. Again, but to avoid uh, burn hazards, clothing and personal protective equipment choice is absolutely crucial. Lastly, for welding associated fume, and an engineered solution is usually required in the form of a fan or fume extraction system to remove the fume from the welder's breathing zone. And if the welder's head is in the plume, which it most likely will be when welding in the basic down hand or flat position, then additional protection will most likely be required in the form of a P2 filter mask, preferably with activated charcoal to remove ozone, or a powered air purifying respirator, which provides positive pressured filtered air in the welder's breathing zone. Lastly, it is not uncommon to see some people wearing uh, welding whilst wearing street clothing or even laboratory dust coats. And in fact, if you look carefully on the screen, there is an ad on TV at the moment for a particular brand of generator where you can see this. These will not insulate a welder from the electric circuit and do not provide any assurance of non-flammability to the welder or the wearer. 
And uh, next slide, please, Bo. Remember, personal protective equipment is always a measure of last resort. But this uh, example you see on the screen does not e come close. And I would like to say, as, as funny as this may look, uh, I have seen a real life example in a, um, a welding fabrication shop, a very large fabrication shop uh, in Victoria some years ago, where the welder had a P2 mask on and he's siggy sticking out of the side of the mask and his helmet over the top. Great filtration uh, process through the cigarette. And uh, uh, next slide, please, Bo, which is our last slide. And at this point in time, I'd like to thank you uh, one and all uh, for your attention. Over to you, Bo. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, now's the time just to pop it in the chat. Bruce, are you able to see those questions? Uh, yes, if they don't come through too thick and fast. Yep, so uh, we've got one here from Mark Solomon. COVID surgical masks appear to have replaced approved P2 respirators on a lot of sites in the minds of employees, that is. Oh, that's not a question yep. so much. Um, okay, I haven't seen that, but that's useful to note and they certainly wouldn't be effective. We don't have any questions at this stage, Bruce. So um, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the AIOH. I know it was a last minute um, presentation that you came in with and mm. it, we really, really appreciate just your flexibility around it um, and to be able to put it together so well within five days. It was really impressive. Thank so you. thank you so much. Um, and and besides the technical difficulties, <laughs> um, <laughs> it happens. There in the end. <laughs> yeah, we got there in the end and I'm sure everybody um, is equally as grateful. Yeah, no, that's it always pays to have a plan B. I haven't encountered this particular situation before. Um, for some reason, uh, Chrome just didn't want to play nice and wouldn't let me share the screen for whatever reason. Oh, all good. It, uh, it's not my first time this has happened. It's always at the 11th hour that something drops out. But um, yeah, look, thank you again. And uh, we're just going to wrap this up. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, you're most welcome to send them through to myself at conference at aioh.org.au and I'll forward them on to Bruce who would be kind enough to answer them for us. Yes, more than happy to help out. And again, I, and again I'd just like to thank the members of the AIOH um, for, uh, who did uh, assist us in the review of the technical notes. And I, I do know that some of these members of the AIOH uh, and we're from the um, regulatory authorities and their input is always gratefully received. Brilliant. <clears throat> okay. I have seen a couple more questions coming through, Luke. I did see yours. Again, I'll, I'll um, take that question. We get a list, a printout of all the questions and I'll take that to Bruce afterwards. Oh, there's one Fantastic here. Thing. It was one here. Does the on torch extraction of felt the, uh, affect the shielding gas? In theory, no. Um, there should be the flow is uh, is somewhat limited so that doesn't affect the shielding gas because if the flow is too high and you crank it up you will lose um, the shielding around the arc and in which case you'll have a quite a porous weld uh, but it certainly as far as the on torch extractors are concerned generally it's not a problem with them there's one more here from Luke. Why is there not a greater push for on-tool ventilation for welding fume? As I said earlier, it's not fa generally favoured by the welders uh, because traditionally the equipment um, has been quite bulky and difficult to use. And it's, and as a result, the welders don't like it. If, they, if they're not comfortable using it, no matter how safe it is, um, you will be wearing the torch and they will not touch it. So it's as simple as that, they will throw it at you. And one more for Melanie. Uh, can you advise how UV radiation from arc welding damages soft slings and working at heights harnesses? I would assume that the, and again, this is a bit area of my area of expertise, but I would assume that um, ultraviolet radiation like uh, any um, form of UV, be it from welding or the sun for that matter, will adversely impact on uh, any polymer slings uh, unless the sling itself is, is well stabilised, the plastic that it's manufactured from. 
is well stabilized or um, is manufactured from maybe from natural fibers, um, then in, in which case there will be a steady deterioration over time. But I would expect that the sling manufacturers and the like would have that in under control as far as their um, testing regime and the like and the life that they may allocate to those slings and devices. That certainly from a, if you're talking a lifting sling, for example, that would be used in a welding shop, these have to be um, examined every so many months anyway uh, by people who uh, know what they're doing, particularly the polymer slings, as, as you would a wire rope to make sure that they are safe for use and are safe to be able to lift the uh, designated load. Another one here from Fang. What do you reckon for controls, including PPE for confined space? Okay, for confined space, there's a couple of other issues you've got to uh, be aware of. Um, firstly, depending on what processes are involved, you can get a high oxygen atmosphere in a controlled, in a, in a confined space. If they're doing flame cutting, for example, there's a lot of oxygen which is not consumed during the cutting process that comes in. So you do need good general extraction occurring in, in the vicinity where welding is taking place. And usually you will require some form of air fed helmet, uh, possibly uh, uh, supplied uh, by air from outside to the, um, to the welders. And um, internally it's, it's common practice to actually have uh, some form of oxygen sensor to make sure that oxygen um, and the like is, is in the, within the approved ranges. Another question from Charles. Any suggestions for increasing compliance with shaving for appropriate fit testing and PPE wear, especially in this workforce cohort? Um, I can't get my two sons to shave, so I've actually got no idea how to get welders to shave. <laughs> It'd be wishful thinking, I think, unfortunately. People, um, I've seen a lot of males uh, turn up to work in the morning. They won't, they won't actually have a shave unless they're, they're going out to impress a lady or, or somebody else for whatever reason later in the day. Um, and that's not untypical. Um, and that includes some managers I've seen. And it also note too that the common trend these days with some of the film stars, which doesn't help, is that the, a lot of the guys wear stubble, uh, a couple of days uh, stubble, and that's fashionable, unfortunately. So that doesn't help. Uh, and lucky last from David Bromwich, UV breaks polymer chains and makes the effective fiber lengths smaller. Oh, sorry, I think that was rather a statement. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that wraps it up. That's a comment from an expert who knows what he's doing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. Um, and again, thank you so much, Bruce. Oh, um, a comment here, employ women. Yes, I think you haven't got the, the problem there. Um, and yes, we do run features in our journals every now and then about women in welding. We, as, as we had a few technical difficulties, I um, wasn't able to share a few polls and, um, and a few resources mm -hmm. that we had. So I will, um, I will link this presentation as well um, in here. Actually, I'll, I'll hand it out now. So if anybody wants to um, have a copy of the presentation, uh, you're most welcome to. I'm just sharing that now. And uh, I'll also make sure that I upload it to the member centre as well. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you again, Bruce. I'm just going to pop the last slide up and thank you everyone. Um, again, we've got another webinar next week, Thursday. Uh, that's on the ventilation webinar, um, again, through the AIHS. Um, so please, uh, please, if you're interested in that, please register and um, we'll be in touch again soon with some more, more webinars. Thank Fantastic. you one and all, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Bruce. You're welcome.